So if you don't know this about me yet, I'm an, I'm an outdoor, a really outdoorsy person. Um, and I really love to camp. And I got this from my parents who took us on several, several camping trips as a child. They now, of course, have graduated in their retirement from the more extreme adventurous camping that we used to do to a luxurious camper. They now do what we call glamping or glamorous camping, if you will. But once upon a time in our old school camping days, we were in Colorado for our annual camping trip where we slept in a tent on the ground. I was about 12, my brothers would have been 15 and 16, and all five of us were headed out on this hiking trip, which was the worst hiking trip I've ever been on in my entire life. You see, my dad had just got this new water bottle, one of the fancy cool ones that like, it filters the water by itself. Um, so you don't have to have anything extra. It's just an automatic filter. So you could fill it directly with water from any stream or lake or anything like that. So obviously we only needed to take one water bottle with us, right? Because we could just keep refilling it. That makes sense, one water bottle for five people. And the plan that we were gonna hike that day was a loop. And we had packed just enough food to have a couple of snacks, and we were gonna go to this lake, eat our sandwiches, and then hike the rest of the loop back to the car. Easy peasy, we'd be back mid-afternoon, no problems. Have you ever tried to read a topographical map of a mountain? You know the ones where they give you, there's this little thing that's like this big in the corner, and that's supposed to tell you how long a mile is? And you just have to like estimate? how far something is. Needless to say, we were off by a lot. This casual four-hour hiking trip turned into a day-long, waterless, remote, hot August hike in the scorching sun on the side of a mountain. Even the crew on Gilligan's Island had more equipment to work with than we did with our one water bottle because in order for our one water bottle to work, what is necessary? There has to be water nearby. <laughs> there wasn't. Angry and dehydrated. In the end, we were all fine. In the moments that we think we couldn't have maybe made one more step, we crested the last ridge and looked down to see a shining green van that meant salvation had finally come at last. That afternoon, I just kept thinking though, while I was hiking, man, it would be nice if a stream appeared or a kind stranger who was way more prepared than we were happened to come out of nowhere with some water. Or maybe we should just become one of those normal families that goes to a nice Wi-Fi enabled KOA for the weekend and do some glamping. I imagine that the crowds that showed up to hear Jesus speaking at that beach were not expecting the day that they had. They probably thought, well, we'll stop by for a bit. You know, maybe he'll talk for like 30 minutes or so, a normal length sermon, and then we can be on our way back to town. Maybe that they thought that it would just, you know, merely wave at them from the boat. I mean, this guy is pretty much a celebrity these days. They just at least wanted to see him, right? Maybe Jesus will just wave. And then that would be it. They'd be on their way. But then, Jesus did more than that. Of course he did. He starts speaking and curing the sick, and time just goes by. You know that feeling when you get like so engrossed in something that you have no idea what time it is? And before you know it, it's several hours later. You forgot that you were hungry. You forgot that you were thirsty. Every gamer on the planet at least knows the feeling that I'm talking about. Or all of us, listen, I have phone app games that I do that with sometimes, and I'm like, where did the day go? But I scored 4,000 on this, no. But then, you know, you always have to come back to reality. It sets in, and you realize your hunger. You realize that maybe your children, your toddler that you brought with you is now hangry. You are in trouble. And there is 30 miles until the next exit that has a restaurant sign. It's now become a really rough afternoon. And then Jesus, right? 
Jesus does the thing that he does. He turns a disastrous situation on a beach into glamping with one blessing. The thing that no one seems to expect, but that inevitably he always does. The thing that we often forget to even ask because it just seems like it would be too good to be true. The thing that the disciples are always surprised that he does every single time. He provides exactly what they need when they need it. Jesus shows up in this way that is often so unexpected that we forget to even look for it. But Jesus shows up, period. And see, Jesus isn't having a very good day. Like he just found out that his cousin died. John the Baptist and Jesus were approximately the same age. And their mothers were pretty close, according to the Gospel of Luke, so that we can only presume that they knew each other well for most of their lives. So this person was his kin. This person was his friend. Was just brutally murdered by the empire. Yes, that evil galactic empire again. Why do you ask? John the Baptist was beheaded because he was telling Herod that it was unlawful to sleep with his brother's wife. Well, actually, that just got him in prison. He was beheaded as a birthday present to his brother's wife's daughter, who asked for it on behalf of her mother. So that's like super messed up. And Jesus just found out about it. And so he actually gets into this boat because he needs some alone time to figure out what all of this means, what's going on. He needs to process. He needs to grieve. He needs to figure out what is this going to mean for him. That his ministry is now more in danger than it ever has been. To grieve the loss of his friend. This man who also preached the good news alongside him. Who baptized him. Who would have played with him as a child. So Jesus isn't having a very good day. And this crowd swarms him while he's trying to grieve and deal with this fresh new information. I don't know about you, but I probably would not have had the social grace that Jesus had to carry on like he did, let alone to go and preach the good news to people and to heal the sick. But he does. He does the thing that Jesus does, the thing that is so unexpected. The thing that we often forget that Jesus does, that Jesus provides, that Jesus provides exactly what we need when we need it. Because Jesus sees the people every time. See, the disciples often see the issue. They see that they don't have enough food for the crowd, not by a long shot. See, we often find the disciples in the Bible response just like this. They always point out the problem. What's wrong? But have you realized they never seem to have a solution? That's just something to ponder. Jesus brings a solution each and ev- to every problem that they face by focusing on the people. They need more wine. Great. Focus on the people. We don't have enough food. Great. Let's fix it. Jesus always provides what the people need when they need it. Despite himself, despite his feelings, despite the doubts of the disciples, and even despite the limitations of physics, Jesus provides. We never know what this is going to look like. We never know when or where. But Jesus always shows up. He shows up with grace and mercy, with food and water, and with wine and bread. Thanks be to God. Amen.